<laughs> so, Mayor of Greater Shepparton City Council, Mr. Dennis Patterson, the Honourable Wendy Lovell, MLC, the Honourable Bill Ford, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are gathered, and I pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. So, in my inaugural speech to Parliament, I made it clear that my speech was not about me, that it was going to be about the electorate of Shepparton. Today, I thought I would talk a little bit more about me and what led me to run for State Parliament. I'll also talk about the 29-day campaign, how I see my role as the independent member, and what I regard as the most important for this electorate. I have been elected to represent the needs of this community. The people of this electorate voted for me based on the campaign that we run. Stand up, Shepparton, it's our turn. I will not lose sight of the fact that we as an electorate have missed out for a long time in many ways, from major investment in infrastructure to addressing the basic needs of disadvantaged members of our community. We have watched for years as Bendigo, Ballarat and Geelong have been invested in, developed and achieved significant social and economic benefits. I believe they got what they got because they were marginal seats. The electorate of Shepparton and Mildura have had the same or greater needs for just as long but have missed out time and time again. I was born in Barham in New South Wales, a town on the Murray River. My parents had taken up a farming property at Noorong, north of sort of Swan Hill Barham, and moved to Jerulbury when I was about six years old. So I spent most of my early years on a property only an hour and a half drive from here at Jerulbury. I started my, sec my primary education by correspondence, as had my older sister and brothers. But when we moved to Jerulbury, I went to the local Catholic primary school. It was a wheat, sheep and irrigation farm and um, life was pretty good. My first, um, well, I, when I finished grade six at the local primary school, my parents decided that I should be sent away to boarding school, mainly because of the educational opportunities that they saw at the time. So I will never forget the day that I was dropped off by my parents on the steps of the school at 11 years of age, knowing that I would not see them again for a long time. And now that I'm a parent, I can identify very much with probably how my mother felt on that day too. My five years spent at boarding school were characterized by a great deal of homesickness. I found it hard to understand why I had needed to be sent away. By the end of year 11, I was determined not to return. I recall my mother taking me to St Vincent's Hospital to enrol me in nursing, but I was still only 16 and they wouldn't accept me. It was going to be my great escape from boarding school. <laughs> my grandmother was living in Melbourne at the time, so she offered to have me. I think I was seen as troublesome and she was helping out. So I went to Canterbury Girls High School for my final year of education. My parents insisted that I had to be at an all-girls school. Um, I found the new environment though very exciting and with the help of some excellent teachers I achieved good marks. I sometimes reflect on the difficulties I presented to my parents but they were calm and tolerant throughout. At the end of year 12, a girlfriend and I took ourselves off to the Sunbury Rock Festival with very little by way of resources. <laughs> When my parents found out I was there, having been told by neighbours that they had seen me on the television news that night, <laughs> they were horrified, made a special trip from Geraldry to Melbourne to just let me know what they thought of my behaviour. <laughs> I was accepted into law at Melbourne University in 1972 and completed the four-year course. I went to demonstrations, so I worked as a student volunteer in the basement of the Fitzroy Town Hall as the legal service was being established. I volunteered at the Church of All Nations in Carlton in an after-school program for migrant children. Not typical of my generation at that time, I married a medical student at age 20, my third year at university. When we both finished university courses, we went off to Darwin for two years, my husband to do his internship and I to complete my articles. It was a really exciting time for me. The Aboriginal Land Rights Act had just been passed and the Northern Territory was moving to self-government. 
I worked for a government that was in a very fast-moving environment and there were lots of exciting things happen. I got to do things at a very young age, an early stage in my career that I would never have had the opportunity to do had I taken the traditional course perhaps in Melbourne. My first child, Alex, was born in 1986 and my second, Claire, in 1990, both in Shepparton. The other four children are actually stepchildren. I only gave birth to two. Um, my first husband and I moved to Shepparton in the early 1980s. We chose Sep Shepparton for a number of reasons. Firstly, it was sort of a halfway mark between Melbourne and the family farm at Geraldry. But it was also a town that was going somewhere. There were many other young professionals coming to the district and we really saw it as a city of opportunity. When my first husband died, my children were four and eight. Being a single parent and working was a challenge. I decided to establish my own legal practice to give me the flexibility I needed to be a parent and to work and earn an income. I always made sure that I had really good household help. I couldn't have managed the two roles, I don't think, without that. As my practice grew, I found myself working full time and employing more staff. But owning my own business still meant I had that flexibility that you just don't get when you work long hours in a law firm for someone else. I remarried about six years later in 2000 and continued my professional life as a lawyer in Shepparton. I have always been engaged in the community. My parents were my primary role models. They were always going to meetings and taught me the importance of community involvement. My mother is a life member of the Country Women's Association. She ran the local drama club in Geraldry for many years, providing an opportunity for people from all walks of life, life to strut the stage, often to the amusement of the locals. <laughs> Geraldry was a lively place to live in those days, as some of you over there will know. The big properties employed lots of jackaroos. The, um, Every organisation in the town seemed to have a ball. There was the Catholic ball, the Masonic ball, the football club ball, the Roundup ball, the bachelor, Bachelors and Spinsters ball, and that's just to name a few. My father was involved with the local St Vincent de Paul Society, visiting the sick and doing the works that they do. He would also travel to Canberra lobbying in relation to rice growing in the area and on irrigation issues and, and other agricultural matters. He loved the land and loved farming despite the fact that he was born to a miner in a little town near Cobar in New South Wales. So for me, being involved in the community was just something I always did. I was attending meetings of the women's electoral lobby, going to rape law reform conferences, joined the Children's Protection Society, and in the years here, spent time on committees for land and water management and leadership groups. In 2000, I did the Williamson Community Leadership Program now known as Leadership Victoria. This was a really wonderful opportunity and truly broadened my horizons and really gave me that perspective of Australia being a big place, but that we were a part of the world. And I think, um, you know, perhaps the penny dropped about that whole global perspective that I hadn't really um, taken into account much before that. In 2003, I joined the RACV board and I became a member of the Institute of Company Directors. I held various other board positions, always remained actively involved with our local um, law association, lobbying for a new courthouse for many years, and just issues generally affecting the local legal profession. So despite community involvement, really I was just a day-to-day -day lawyer practicing law in Shepparton. I represented respondent parties in the Yorta Yorta case from 1994 through until 2002 when the final High Court decision was made. I've been a family law specialist since 1993. So that was my life up until the 29th of October 2014. People ask me what made me leave the law firm and stand for Parliament. I've lived in Shepparton for over 32 years now and have witnessed a great deal of change. I believe that our region did not grow and advance in comparison to regional areas near us. And I think that has had to have been due partly to a lack of investment by both state and federal governments. There have been many other factors impacting on this region and we all know them. We've had the worst drought um, in history during the last decade. 
But for years now, we have watched as the marginal seats of Bendigo, Ballarat and Geelong enjoyed huge investment compared to us. I've privately lamented the fact that our public transport, our roads, hospitals, social services and education systems for years have not got the investment they needed. I was often part of a much wider conversation about that. I knew there was deep discontent in the community and that people felt disillusioned with the political parties. People felt that the loyalty that they had shown to the National Party for many years was not being repaid. They felt that they were not getting the attention that the marginal seats were getting. The National Party had held the seat for over 47 years. Jeanette Powell was retiring. She had... Um, served for a long time and then Greg Barr, a member of her staff of some years, had been pre-selected by the National <coughs> Party to take his place. While there were some other candidates standing, the general view was that there probably wasn't anyone who would knock off the Nationals. Despite there being a retiring National Party member, the Liberal Party chose not to stand someone. They had done a deal, an arrangement with the National Party that prevented them from standing um, a candidate in this electorate. By late October, the election campaign had started. Promises of amazing proportions were being made in our other marginal electorates. Among the people I talked to at work, socially, elsewhere, there was a general feeling that nothing was going to change. I felt frustrated. It seemed no one with a good chance of taking the seat from the Nationals was going to stand. The idea planted itself in my head, and I thought about it for a few days. My children had grown up and left home. My partners in the legal practice, when I flagged it with them, were pretty keen. I don't really know whether they thought I'd win or not. <laughs> my husband, initially, when I raised it with him, was probably not keen. He was probably the first person who turned his mind to the fact that I might actually win. But I had to have his support to do it. In addition to needing his support, he was also a lot better known in this community than I was. He had treated over 35,000 children during his time practicing as a paediatrician in Shepparton and had also been very involved in the local community, always advocating on family and children's issues. So at this point, I talked to a few people in the community who I knew would instantly give me an honest response. And I also knew that if they thought I had a chance, that they would provide the support for a campaign. I guess within a few days, um, we held a meeting and we had 30 people at it. The support was clear. There was a strong feeling that we had a chance. So. I guess on everyone's lips at the end of that Thursday night meeting was, could we really win the safest seat in this state with just 29 days left to campaign? When the call went out for donations, I was heartened. A grandfather walked in off the street and put $50 in the funding pool. Volunteers bought t-shirts and community and business leaders donated generously. Shortly before the election, we had at least 150 volunteers and had raised sufficient funds to construct what the Nationals Party leader, Peter Ryan, later described as a well-orchestrated ambush. <laughs> we employed advertising, communications, volunteers, community engagement professionals, all sorts of people. People, we, we paid some, we, and then we had heaps of volunteers. So by election day, we were able to man every single booth in this election with um, people wearing our Stand Up Shepherd and uh, T-shirts. I went from one end of the electorate to the other with trusty, trusty campaign people. Um, I talked to farmers, bakers, business people, stay-at-home mums and students. We were given a bare, empty shop in the middle of town as our campaign office. I telephoned Kathy McGowan for some ideas. She was terrific, but I was much too late to adopt the strategies of her campaign. It was like we were all in the middle of a storm and we had to keep up the momentum and increase it at all costs to election day. We had a truly remarkable campaign team. The group of women around me on a day-to-day -day basis, in the car, walking the streets, and in the campaign office were fabulous. 
The days and nights were really long. Beyond this were the men and women helping with the advertising, putting up the banners and posters, driving around with hoardings on trailers, preparing for election day, managing the finances and constantly doing the numbers. At one point someone told me that Tom Waterhouse was giving me 12 to 1. <laughs> At that stage I didn't think I was a safe bet, but apparently a few others did. The age described it as a perfect storm. Exit polls suggest that the deeply unpopular Abbott government played a role. Then there was the Federal Agriculture Minister Barnaby Joyce's comment that SPC Ardmona was not an issue for the Nationals. And finally they referred to the Indi effect, independent Cathy McGowan's successful campaign. While there's been much discussion about how we pulled off this campaign, I think it was much more about this electorate and where the people were at and how they felt. People were ready for a change and the timing was right. The campaign slogan of stand up Shepherd and it's our turn resonated so strongly and it still makes the hair stand up on the back of some people's neck when we say it. It evoked a response in the electorate. They knew, they just absolutely knew that we had been missing out compared to our neighbouring electorates who were marginal. But it was still a shock to win to cause what was described as the upset of the state election, to take the safest seat in the state with a whopping 32.5% swing. <coughs> so I want to say something about my electorate. Some of you will know this and some of you have heard me say it before, but it is well worth talking about. This region has seen enormous development and population growth. It has been brought about by access to irrigation, fertile land, and the climate needed to enable agriculture, horticulture, and other industries to flourish. But this development has not been without a lot of challenges, and many of them have been in our recent history with some of the worst floods, bushfires, and the worst drought of our time during the first drought of the decade of this century. We've become Victoria's and Australia's most diverse community we speak over 30 languages in our homes by virtue of the very diverse multicultural population from many parts of the world who have settled here. I feel very proud of this community. In a world that seems to be full of conflict, we live side by side with families, men, women and children from all across the world. We've always been a very creative and industrious and self-starting community and at the forefront of global food production. The region has the highest proportion of food processing firms in rural Australia. It's the home to major companies such as Simplot, Fonterra, uh, Nestle, Unilever, Murray Gold and Bega, and of course SPC. It's worth noting the significance of annual production and why it is the most productive and intensely farmed area in Australia. Often referred to as the food bowl of Australia, the region produces close to 25% of the total value of Victoria's agricultural product production. We produce the vast majority of the nation's fruit per category. 86% 86, 86 of all pears in Australia are grown here, 28% of the nation's apple crop is grown here and 70% of the peach crop. The Murray, Dale, the Murray region is the largest milk producer. So irrigation is critical to the region's agricultural production and manufacturing and the irrigation modernisation scheme is beginning to reap rewards through secure efficient water supply. The region is also known for the significant presence of transport, warehousing and packing firms including Busy Logistics, Amcor, Heating Transport, Crescus Brothers and numerous others. Shepparton's got the climate, the water and the people. It just needs the infrastructure, the educational investment and support to harness and develop the advantages that we have naturally. It needs an equitable share of government resources. People now recognise the inequity between the per capita spend on residents in rural and regional areas as compared to metropolitan areas. They also see the stark difference in attention that some regional areas have enjoyed as compared to ours. The voters in this electorate have observed the investment and attention that their neighbouring electorates have received because they are marginal. I believe that the voters recognise that their loyalty to political parties was no longer serving them and that to be put on the map they needed to demand equity. 
When budget figures were analysed showing massive discrepancies between the level of per capita spend on residents of Ballarat and Bendigo as compared to Shepparton, the reaction was inevitable. The slogan, Stand Up Shepparton, It's Our Turn, had real meaning. If changing their vote was what they were required to do to be heard in their demands for critical investment in infrastructure and services, such as the neighbouring regions had been receiving, then they were prepared to do that and they did. My campaign focused on four major issues, quality health services, investment in transport infrastructure, including passenger rail services and the Shepparton Bypass, demands for policies to provide solutions to the highest youth unemployment rate in the state of Victoria and the third highest in Australia. And closely associated with this, an investment in educational opportunities and pathways at all levels. My discussions with ministers in the Andrews Labor government to date have been frank and so far all indications are that they want to work with me. Six ministers have already visited the region, with the Minister for Agriculture visiting a second time on Friday, and I look forward to welcoming all the other ministers soon. No major commitments have been made yet, but I hope by laying the groundwork now, by showing the ministers what we need and why, the region will once again be on the map in terms of funding. My greatest fear sometimes is that I'll be denied the time I need to work on my major election commitments because of the huge number of other issues that arise on a daily on behalf of constituents and groups within the electorate. The time required to prepare for Parliament, to be at Parliament, the meetings, the letters, the emails, the phone calls. My fear is that all of this will distract me from the main game, and the main game was my election promises. Well, promises, yeah. Um, but because I'm not a member of a political party, I need to make informed decisions on all the legislation that comes before me. When a parliamentary vote is taken, I'm the first person asked how I'm going to vote. So the doors are shut, the doors are locked, the speaker then calls on the membership for Shepparton and everybody's looking. <laughs> While I can see that the longer that I am in, in Parliament as a member, the more I am likely to achieve, I cannot allow myself to, to be distracted by trying to please everyone so that I get re-elected. I've got to run the campaigns that I promised I would run and do the best I can with the rest of it. My support base is the community, the electorate and the people here that I draw on for advice. I know that the next election will be a hardly fought campaign with all the parties in the mix against me and against each other. This was our goal, to make it marginal. However, I feel committed in the time that I'm here to try and achieve the best that I can to the extent that I can the goals that I articulated during that campaign. I hope to deliver more frequent and convenient train services as a priority and to achieve significant best investment over the longer term so that our rail will support Velocity trains with services ultimately mirroring, mirroring those of Bendigo. So draw a 50 kilometre map around Shepparton and you have the same population as Bendigo. I can't see any reason why we shouldn't have what they have. I hope to persuade the government to provide staged investment required by Golden Valley Health to carry out its master plan. I hope to make a dent on youth unemployment figures through engaging industry and new education policies. I want to see a future for this electorate that is sustainable, that is healthy, and in which people can safely live, raise their families and work. I've been informed that there are people who have said that my election is the worst thing that could have happened for the Shepparton District. I disagree. Shepparton District is no longer represented by a political party. It is represented by a community advocate. Thank you. Club policy, we like uh, questions and not statements. 
So, uh, who'd like to ask a question? They're always a bit shy at the start. <laughs> Um, oh, sorry, and we've got a uh, microphone here, but uh, Sonia, I'll bring that. Hi, um, I'm Rex Martinich from the Hamilton Spectator, and I'm also the uh, Vice President of the Royal Press Club of Victoria. Uh, my question is your um, theory about your victory personally uh, appears to centre on the mood of the electorate rather than the external factors. Um, does that mean that, that similar victories in other uh, communities around Victoria might not be possible until the communities themselves decide that they're not happy with their traditional representation? Well, I suppose it does. I mean, it, it, it's only going to be in some electorates where there's that high level of discontent, I suppose. But, I mean, why would Bendigo, Ballarat and Geelong be... I mean, they are marginal, but... Um, they've, in a sense, been seen by me as having the best of both worlds because they are marginal. And I think, you know, I think there's really general acceptance, even though people don't like to articulate it, that being a marginal seat is what gets you the attention. Everyone needs to focus their mind on um, what, on, on the electorate, think about how people are going to vote, and actually start taking care of the needs of that electorate. And so. Um, and I think it has to be in a big way. I mean, my, my feeling, and I know, you know, I can't help but offend people by saying this, but, you know, I'm not that interested in getting a few thousand dollars for the local hall or, you know, the small things. I want to spend my time focusing on the things that will make the big difference. And that will be good rail and it'll be, it'll be health services. And people said to me, you know, what have you got to offer farmers? And I say, farmers get sick Farmers have kids. Farmers need all the same things that we need. So, you know, I mean, I've got a rural background. I came off a farm. I, I know that stuff. But when it came to this community, the outstanding things were those things that we hadn't had enough investment in. So, you know, I've got to... Uh, my, my, my thought is I've got to stay focused on producing and working on the things that really matter and that will make a difference. And I'm getting off the question, but... I think, um, you know, everything's always multifactorial, I guess, and, um, you know, the Barnaby comment and, um, you know, those sorts of things. I don't know, but my feeling on the ground, and I think all of those of us who were in the campaign and out there each day saw it much more as just how people here felt. So, you know, I think... Um, you know, to to get people who were Liberals to vote for me, to get people who were Labor to vote for me, and to get rusted on Nationals to vote for me, meant that it was about us, about our electorate, I believe. <coughs> so other areas, um, you know, Gippsland, I mean, I wonder if a really strong independent had had the time to, to run a campaign there, whether they would have had a good chance, but... Um, I don't know. You see, I also had the view that the community are probably getting a bit sick of people who have had long periods in electorate offices and haven't been really part of the workforce out there, part of part of the community in the sense of running your own business or working in in industries within our within our electorate and. Um, you know, there's a lot of people in Parliament now who are almost professional politicians who have simply come up through the unions or the party, and I think I think people are starting to think that maybe that's not a good thing. Um, it came from so many places, including myself, um, that uh, 
I, um, I feel an obligation to the electorate because the reason those people donated was because they wanted to make this seat a marginal seat too. So I think um, my, my, I mean, we, we've achieved that in that we are a marginal seat. Um, I think that, um, you know, I mean, I, I have to say I don't feel any particular obligation to any of those people because they were all wanting what we all wanted and that was to make a change and to, um, to make it a marginal seat. So, um, you know, whether, um, whether I'll always make them happy or not, I don't know, but they'll probably let me know if I don't. But that is, that, that is not what will guide me. Hi, my name's Michelle Slater. I'm from the Namurka Leader. Um, would you be able to tell us where you stand on the political spectrum? So what side of politics would you closely <laughs> align yourself <laughs> with? And also, um, on, um, on that kind of angle, we've heard a lot about your four main strengths of, um, of where you're campaigning. Run us through some of your other um, areas. So where do you stand on things like the environment, the arts? I've heard you mention renewables lately. Just briefly, some of those things. Okay. Um, so where am I? I'm, I'm probably just an awful mishmash of a whole lot of things, you know. Um, I like some Labor things, I like some Liberal things, you know, there's some, you know, I wish the Nationals could be even much more um, stronger advocates than, um, than they've perhaps been. I, I, I wish the Nationals were the strong voice of rural Australia. I wish they wouldn't go and join in government with the Liberals and, and lose their voice. Um, I, I mean, I... You know, I'm an independent, so I'm none of those things, and I don't know that you can actually pin me left or right or anywhere in particular because I probably am a, you know, I have views that would fit with a range of political party, perhaps some um, aspirations. So on some things they'd be really pleased to hear me give a view, and on others they'd be, they'd be unhappy. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I ran the campaign based on you know, having some strong points out there to really hammer home and, and points of difference with the marginal seats. So what we weren't getting, what they were getting. So um, I think I needed a clear message and that's what I did. But, you know, on other things, you know, I think the arts are fantastic. They elevate us, we need them. I am absolutely behind um, a new SAM for Shepparton and um, I think that'll bring a lot of benefit to our district. Um, the environment I think is critical and um, you know I, I feel very strongly that um, we need to look at a whole lot of alternatives so you know you, you think about something like um, and I'll probably be on the front page of the paper for this tomorrow but um, you know the problems in relation to whether gas is going to go to Nathalia or not now gas prices they say are going to triple shortly so you know, is rolling out gas to some of these towns that was decided on a long time ago actually going to be the best solution for country towns if it's going to cost more than electricity? I mean, these are things we really need to look at. And also, is there an opportunity for some really innovative renewable projects that towns could look at adopting that might be an entirely different alternative and a better one than, than either of those other sources of energy? I mean, towns like Tatura are facing a circumstance where their um, capacity to get energy to the town is now being limited, and yet they've got all these food processing companies there, they need more energy. They are probably going to have to look at renewable energy as an alternative, as an extra to um, add into the system. So um, I uh, feel um, really quite excited about the prospects of the future and I think we need to look at all the alternatives that are before us and try and make really wise decisions and you know sometimes I think in a regional community we might be even better suited to do that because um, I don't know I, you know the, if you can get the investment then I think the opportunity to be innovative and we always have been here um, is there so um, you know, Shepparton, I remember in the early 80s, was going to be the solar city. Well, 
it somehow just disappeared off the agenda along the way. But more than ever, it really could be. I mean, these huge solar farms, we are perfectly situated to have one in this electorate. So let's, let's lobby for it. Yeah. Yes? Is there news, Susan? Early on, that um, perhaps you would turn out to be a bit of a one hit wonder, that you'd only be around for one term, work hard on the, the, the very issues that you've talked about, be off. What do you say to such suggestions? Um, well, Look, the electorate will judge me on that. Um, what can I achieve? I guess the reality is, and it's no secret, that, um, and I've said it many times, I'm prepared to work with the government that's in power, and at the moment it's a Labor government. Um, they're probably pretty happy that there's not a Nationals here anymore. So, um, you know, I, I hope that um, they will work with me so that um, I will be able to achieve some things and the electorate will see that I've been able to achieve some things and that might stand me in good stead for the next election. Now, if, um, you know, if as I say, well, it's not an if, the fact is everyone's going to be fighting for this seat at the next election and let's hope we see some really good, big promises being made for this area because there weren't very many last time. Um, you know, I guess, um, you know, I think one of, the, one of the traps with becoming a politician is, the, is that getting your head around the election cycle and starting to think about, you know, will you get re-elected next time. It's a bit of a trap. I think, you know, we've got to be, well, for me, I need to be very careful about that and not let that drive me because I had a life and I'll have a life again. But I do consider it a great um, opportunity and an honour to be standing here doing this. And if I can do it well, and if people want me to continue and, I, and, and all the circumstances are right, then I would ask them to vote for me again. But it's not going to be my main driver. Uh. Uh, Connor, an unemployed job seeker, yeah. but a long time resident of Shepparton. Um, my question to you is about hydrogen rail. Um, the report is out, and the uh, desks uh, of um, both the and the previous and the press. Sorry, just hold it very close to your mouth. I apologise for the uh, faulty mic. Thank you. Sorry. Um, my question is about high-speed rail, and uh, the report came out uh, about a year ago. Um, it's laying dormant on the desks of both the federal government and the previous state government and the present state government. And um, I just wanted to know whether you are up to speed with high-speed rail and what your thoughts are on it as something to open up development right down the east coast of Australia, including Shepparton, where a stop is scheduled to be placed. Excuse me. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Um, so um, there's a, that report sitting on my desk, and um, I'm pretty sure there's an appointment in my diary to get a briefing on that. But it's sort of something I've been following in the sense that, you know, generally we probably all have. So. Um, you know, I guess the thing that always springs into my mind when we talk about high speed rail is the route and that we are, please God, on it um, in Shepparton. So um, that, um, that to me is probably the priority is, you know, how it will benefit this electorate as a first step. But, um, you know, then there's obviously the wider benefit to the state and the country that, um, that you refer to. Um, I intend to get across it. And, um, you know, I've got so many briefings yet to have. My whole first three months really has been every organisation and group um, that you could imagine making appointments to come and see me and me going to see them to be fully briefed on all these issues. And 
my God, there are so many, but you know, some of them are standouts in that they will truly benefit this electorate in, in significant ways, and um, I would see those as being the ones to focus on. Uh, Robin Lipshut to Chirrut, no other label. Uh, do you feel you are getting enough coverage and support in the local media? I just haven't got the media worked out at all. I, um, <laughs> I, um, I'm, I've been lobbying the government for an extra staff resource, so I, um, and I've been getting a bit of help with that. We're sort of working on these things called press releases that you're meant to prepare and get out there all the time, and um, I, um, I, I just haven't quite, um, you know, mastered how to be in the media enough. I think they probably want to report on me, but um, I'm maybe, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't think there's any resistance to um, covering stories that I'm involved in. Um, but, um, you know, there's this, um, the, the reality is it seems that the way you get in the media is you, you know, ring up the media and let them know that you've got a story or that you're going to say something about something and you get a press release ready and you go about it in a way that um, somehow um, has the effect of getting you in the paper and, uh, you know, my colleagues are pretty good at that and I've just got to get better at it. Susanna, I'm with Sleep Garden Communications. If you ever need some advice, you can come and see us. <laughs> um, years ago, I worked for the Victorian Farmers Federation. That's when I was involved in the press club. And I guess as a press club, we're interested in what the role of the media is, particularly local newspapers. And perhaps not so much in Shepparton, but other places around the state that have been cuts in local newspapers. So what do you see the role of local media as? And also, what impact do you think cuts on local media might have on reporting of local issues, particularly in, in areas like Shepparton and North East? Um, I, I was thinking about that just recently with the cuts to the Border Mail and you know what Fairfax are doing across the country at the moment. And um, it seems to me that we've... Um, so, you know, on, on my iPad I've got the Financial Review, the Shepparton News, the Age, the Herald Sun. Um, and so, you know, I... I digest it that way but I also get all the papers delivered and and, and it's really quite a different experience um, how you how you get your media you know whether it's a hard copy newspaper or the other way and um, and I think you know generate you know from a generational point of view it's really important that we still have newspapers reporting the news and that local media are very much involved in in getting the news out to people on a local level, especially, well, I don't know, I say especially in regional areas, I don't know what it's like for city people, but um, I think um, I, I, I'm, I'm concerned that they're all getting a bit smaller and there's less advertising and so the incentive to, to be, you know, significant, strong newspapers is clearly being devalued and um, and I, I don't think that's a good thing. I think it's still too early in that cycle of generational change for that to be happening. And that a whole lot of people, you know, run the risk of missing out on access to um, the news and media if we go through that process too soon. It may be the ultimate result that we're all on devices, but um, I, don't, I don't think we're um, ready to move to that at the pace we are. Hi, Stella. My name's Carly Brooks and I'm from Baruga, just outside your area. I just had a question. Because you are faced with a time restraint in delivering the promises, is there some way that you can use the communities within your seat um, in a more collaborated effort? So, like, you're not backed by a party. Can you help the community that put you into the seat help you get those jobs done? I believe so, and um, I'll be calling on them pretty soon um, for campaign <laughs> number one. <laughs> So watch this space, everybody. Um, I think that's uh, that's all I do have. Um, so it's very important to me that uh, the people who supported me are prepared to continue to support me um, in those efforts as I try to, you know, work on 
work on these issues that I that I put out there. Very important. But also, um, you know, I I'm conscious of being in the car and driving to the other towns and sitting down and talking about things that are issues for um, for people in you know in various communities and. Um, and you know, getting a good feel for what's important on the ground, and and I think um, I hope that if I'm listening to them, they'll listen to me, and that together we might be prepared to work on some things. Hello, Susan. Thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Dennis Ginner, and I'm with the Voices for Indo. Um, I was watching Q and A Q and A the other night, and uh, and we was set in the rural East of, um, the show in Sydney, and it was, it was obviously farm focused, and but there were those sort of stereotypical iconic um, surroundings, accoutrements like hay bales and country hats, and I just sort of wonder with regard to the and, and I know agriculture is so important to us all, it's so important. I'll never say the opposite. But the, the numbers of farmers relative to the numbers of people who are non-farmers living in rural Australia, I think is a really quite prescient. There's about nationally, I think it's 100,000 to 4.9 million. I'm just wondering, it seems like the power of rural communities is going to be informing new partnerships in terms of how we get represented as opposed to the more the iconic, stereotypical representation of rural as being farming. I just wonder if you could comment on how you can see those partnerships could develop well uh, and not to leave anyone behind. I, I, um, I thought that a lot during the campaign as I went around that um, you know, the farming community is only a small part of our community um, in numbers and you know Golden Valley Health is you know, the biggest employer and education, the education department and and you know so many other big service providers employ so many of the numbers of people who live in our community, and uh, and they you know they have a different view of the world often to perhaps the way farmers do, and um, and I suspect that you know that probably had an influence on my success in the campaign too because. Um, while I, while I know for a fact that a number of you know, farming people did vote for me and for the first time they ever changed their vote from national. But, but I, um, yeah, I think it is that change that you're referring to that brought me to where I am really and that, that there is a different feeling out there. Um, I, I admire Cathy McGowan's campaign because of that longer term investment she's done in her community to bring people along and to engage young people and and uh, and the voices of Indi and I've got you know Kate Orty's tweet on my my um, phone and I see what Eurola are doing and um, and I I can see the value of that and I think about that and I think is this something we might be able to get going or do here and I don't know yet. I've just had too much to get my head around in this short time but it is in my mind and I see that process happening and um, and I, I like it and I, you know, I like the inclusiveness of it and I think that, that perhaps that is um, you know, a way to engage people more and and you know this election that the last election in Shepparton was just a nothing um, dare I say until I stood I mean suddenly people became really interested in the election and everyone was talking about it and people were engaged and you know that's just got to be such a good thing rather than just you know same old you know so um, so maybe maybe there are opportunities and when I get time I'll be coming to see you. <laughs> <coughs> time for one more question. <coughs> Thank you. Um, congratulations, Susanna again. Um, John Head from Shepherd Foot Clinic, podiatry if you need podiatry, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, the Sand Museum. You said that you are supportive of it. Uh, I, um, just uh, do you have comments about um, our indigenous culture and multiculturalism and what that would mean for that as well? I think about. I think the thing I really like about this whole proposal for Sam is the um, 
it's not just going to be an art gallery. It's a really multi-purpose, community engaging sort of design and um, and philosophy around it that makes it something entirely different. And I think it it is that which may also appeal to the government. You know, if, if we were just looking for another place to hang our paintings and put all those ceramics in the basement on display. Um, I don't think we get very far, but I think this notion of our multiculturalism, our indigenous population, the Kayala Gallery being perhaps incorporated into it, and um, you know the opportunities, along with the economic benefits that you know have been shown to go with having a regional art gallery that's a success. I think all of those things you know really combine to make it. Um, an important project and so you know I mean that, that that's really why I support it I think um, I think it's going to make art much more accessible to everybody and uh, in and it will really benefit that discussion and interaction between the groups that I mean that you know that the arts festival has shown itself to be able to do the Saturday night emerge festival I mean, there, there are things that have developed over the last number of years with the with all the new arrivals into our community and the incorporation of them and and um, you know the Rumbalara football and their ball club and a lot of the projects associated with that that are that are showing really promising signs of you know community coming together and I think Sam is just another step in that process through that process too soon. It may be the ultimate result that we're all on devices, but um, I, don't, I don't think we're um, ready to move to that at the pace we are. Hi Sam, my name's Carly Brooks and I'm from Baruga, just outside your area. I just had a question, because you are faced with a time restraint in delivering the promises. Is there some way that you can use the communities within your seat um, in a more collaborated effort? So like you're not backed by a party, can you help the community that put you into the seat help you get those jobs done? I believe so and um, I'll be calling on them pretty soon um, for campaign <laughs> number one. So, <laughs> so watch this space everybody. Um, I think that's, uh, that's all I do have. Um, so it's very important to me that uh, the people who supported me are prepared to continue to support me um, in those efforts as I try to, you know, work on work on these issues that I that I put out there. Very important, but also, um, you know, I I'm conscious of being in the car and driving to the other towns and sitting down and talking about things that are issues for. Um, for people in you know in various communities and um, and you know getting a good feel for what's important on the ground and and I think um, I hope that if I'm listening to them they'll listen to me and that together we might be prepared to work on some things. Susan, thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Dennis Ginnivan, I'm with the Voices for Inday. Um, I was watching Q&A &A, Q &A the other night and, uh, and we was sat in the Royal East, um, the show in Sydney and it was obviously farm focused and, but there were those sort of stereotypical iconic um, surroundings, accoutrements like hay bales and country hats and I just sort of wonder with regard to the, and, and I know agriculture is so important to us all it's so important, I'll never say the opposite, but the, the numbers of farmers relative to the numbers of people who are non-farmers living in rural Australia, I think is a really quite prescient. It's about nationally, I think it's 100,000 to 4.9 million. I'm just wondering, it seems like the power of rural communities is going to be informing new partnerships in terms of how we get represented as opposed to the more the iconic 
the stereotypical representation of rural as being farming. I just wonder if you could comment on how you can see those partnerships could develop well uh, and not to leave anyone behind. I, I, um, I thought that a lot during the campaign as I went around that um, you know, the farming community is only a small part of our community um, in numbers. And you know, Golden Valley Health is you know the biggest employer, and education, the education department, and and you know so many other big service providers employ so many of the numbers of people who live in our community, and uh, and they you know they have a different view of the world often to perhaps the way farmers do, and. Um, and I suspect that you know that probably had an influence on my success in the campaign too, because um, while I while I know for a fact that a number of you know, farming people did vote for me, and for the first time they ever changed their vote from national, but but I um, yeah I think it is that change that you're referring to that brought me to where I am really, and that that there is a different feeling out there. Um, I, I admired Kathy McGowan's campaign because of that longer term investment she's done in her community to bring people along and to engage young people and and uh, and the voices of Indi and I've got you know Kate Orty's tweet on my my um, phone and I see what Eurola are doing and um, and I. I can see the value of that and I think about that and I think is this something we might be able to get going or do here and I don't know yet, I've just had too much to get my head around in this short time but it is in my mind and I see that process happening and um, and I I like it and I you know I like the inclusiveness of it and I think that, that perhaps that is um, you know a way to engage people more and and you know this election that the last election in Shepparton was just a nothing um, dare I say until I stood I mean suddenly people became really interested in the election and everyone was talking about it and people were engaged and you know that's just got to be such a good thing rather than just you know same old you know so um, so maybe maybe there are opportunities, and when I get time, I'll be coming to see you. <laughs> <coughs> time for one more question. Thank you. Um, congratulations, Susanna, again. Um, John Head from Shepherd Foot Clinic Podiatry. If you need podiatry, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the uh, the Sand Museum. You said that you are supportive of it. Uh, I, um, just uh, do you have comments about um, our indigenous culture and multiculturalism and what that would mean for that as well? I think about. I think the thing I really like about this whole proposal for Sam is the. Um, it's not just going to be an art gallery. It's a really multi-purpose, community engaging, sort of design and. Um, and philosophy around it that makes it something entirely different and I think it, it is that which may also appeal to the government. You know, if, if we were just looking for another place to hang our paintings and put all those ceramics in the basement on display, um, I don't think we'd get very far but I think this notion of our multiculturalism, our indigenous population, the Kayla Gallery being perhaps incorporated into it and um, you know the opportunities along with the economic benefits that you know have been shown to go with having a regional art gallery that's a success i think all of those things you know really combine to make it um, an important project and so you know i mean that that's that's really why i support it i think um i think it's going to make art much more accessible to everybody and uh, in and it will really benefit that discussion and interaction between the groups that I mean that you know that the arts festival has shown itself to be able to do the Saturday night emerge festival I mean, there, there are things that have developed over the last number of years with the with all the new arrivals into our community and the incorporation of them and and um, you know the Rumbalara football and netball club and a lot of the projects associated with that that are that are showing really promising signs of 
you know, community coming together and I think Sam is just another step in that process. Susanna, thank you for your time today um, for being here <coughs> and, uh, and for giving real insight into uh, what made you uh, take that position with 29 days and um, not that you were cutting it fine, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and also uh, what you plan to do and uh, uh, the comment that uh, we're going to have a real fun fight for the next election here and put on everyone's radar, it's, um, it's terrific. So we'd just like to uh, present you with a little something uh, for your time and uh, thanks once again.